by far the most common question that I get about all the stuff that I post here on YouTube is this. How do you go from sounding and looking like this? To looking and sounding like this. That's right, it's not about two five ones, it's not about different scales, it's not about transcription. It's about the actual production and recording process for these videos. With that in mind, today's lesson is gonna be something a little bit different. Don't worry, next lesson we'll be right back to talking about improvisation, talking about jazz, talking about a little bit of trombone playing. But today we are gonna dig into some of the finer points of how you can work on recording good quality trombone material even if you are not a recording engineer. All right, thanks for tuning in today. Like I said, we're dealing with some different things today, talking about some recording stuff, maybe a little bit of mixing stuff. For those of you who do follow me over in my virtual studio, don't fear, there will be a lesson there for you as well, talking about something that is also a little bit different. I didn't think this stuff would translate so well into a virtual studio lesson. There is gonna be some sort of one-off stuff there that is not so connected to this week's lesson here, but normally we will keep things kind of paired up. Since this is not really the normal content that I cover here on this channel, I thought it might just be important to talk about why we're discussing this today. As I already mentioned, it's a common question that I get from lots of both musicians I know in person and a lot of musicians online as well. So I thought it would make sense to just sort of like answer all those questions in one shot here. In addition though, I think it's also really important for us as performing musicians to have a little bit of knowledge about this stuff. It's really important to know a little bit about microphone selection, a little bit about EQ so that you can communicate maybe at a live show with the sound engineer, or if you are interested in recording at home, or maybe when you go into the studio to record, you have a little bit of knowledge to just know how to make those choices, know how to communicate with the recording engineer and just get the best possible outcome that you can have. All right, here we are with the obligatory popping into the video after the fact. So this week's lesson, after I recorded and I went to mix it, it turned out it was gonna be about 40 minutes long. Lots of information here and I maybe got a little carried away. So I decided to split it into two lessons. So this will be actually the next two posts I'll make here on YouTube. This week's content is gonna be all about things like microphone selection, a little bit about our room setup, maybe a little bit about acoustic treatment, all the stuff that we do when we are tracking. Part two will be all about the mixing process. So EQ, compression, reverb, all that sort of thing we do after we've recorded, along with just a little bit about the other sort of production elements, lighting, camera, that type of stuff. Very little bit there, because that's not the main focus of this channel, obviously. I'll pop in again at the end of this week's lesson to kind of like round it off, and then again at the beginning of the next one to sort of set it up, because I didn't originally film it that way. So I'll have to just add a little bit more extra of me talking to make it all make sense. All right, so back in to our discussion about tracking for trombone. Before we get into the stuff we're gonna talk about today, I should preface this by saying I am not an audio engineer. When I started posting things on YouTube a couple years ago, I had a ton of learning to do. Now I had a little bit of a background of mixing live sound, so that kind of gave me a baseline of understanding some of the concepts but it was really a pretty big learning curve that I had to do. A lot of times people ask me, well, Sean, how'd you know how to do all this stuff? The answer is I didn't. I just started watching YouTube stuff. I started practicing, I started learning. To learn how to do these sort of things on a baseline level, it's definitely a skill anybody can work on. To do it at a really high level is really an art form. And so that's not really what we're talking about today. We're talking about sort of nuts and bolts, practical recording things and mixing things that really any musician can use. Cool, the main two concepts that we're gonna talk about here are number one, mic selection, and number two, your room setup. Now, when we're talking about mic selection, there are a ton of different options. You could find a lot of information online, but today we're really only gonna worry about understanding the three different types of microphones and how they can help us as brass players. Those three types are condenser microphones, dynamic microphones, and ribbon microphones. To start out, let's talk about condenser microphones. So today I'm gonna to be using this KSM32. This is a Shure microphone, a uh, very generous Doyle tip where a friend of mine allowed me to borrow this. I actually don't have a condenser microphone in my locker right now. We'll talk about why that is in a second, but this is a real classic choice and just something that sounds pretty good on almost anything. Condenser microphones tend to be a little brighter sounding, a little airier sounding for us as brass players. They also tend to be the most quote unquote accurate sounding mic. They are going to reproduce for the most part really what you're hearing in the room without a lot of coloration. And so that way they can be great. The downside for us as brass players is because we are often mic'd relatively close, they can end up reproducing some of the less desirable parts of our sound. 
the air sound, some of those more harsh harmonics. And so this is not actually my go-to microphone, except when paired with another microphone, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, our second type of microphone is this. This is a dynamic microphone. This is a Sennheiser MD421. This is an absolute classic microphone. This is my go-to for live sound, and I actually love the way it sounds recorded as well. Dynamic microphones tend to have kind of like a punchy sound recorded, very like up front, maybe not quite as detailed as a condenser or a ribbon, but they can work really great. And if you had to just buy one microphone to do some recording on, I would buy a dynamic microphone, maybe something like this or possibly an Electro Voice RE20. Those are both really great choices. You could do a ton of really good recording on those. And additionally, you could use them when you're playing live to make sure you always have a really good quality microphone for your live performances. The other thing that's great about a dynamic microphone, they really reject other sound. That's what they're really great at. They have a tight pickup pattern and they're not quite as sensitive as a condenser microphone. So they're not gonna pick up a bunch of the room or other instruments as long as they're placed correctly. Finally, my go-to microphone for recording, at least right now, and a lot of musicians, is a ribbon microphone. I'm using a Royer R101. So Royer is a name that you might be familiar with, probably more familiar with the R121. That is an absolute classic on trombone, and actually, if I had the money, I would have one of those. They're about 1600 bucks. This is a model that Royer was making in sort of the 2000s, mid 2000s, they're not manufactured anymore. I recorded on it once in a studio a couple years ago and I was like, oh, that microphone sounds really nice. If I have the opportunity to pick one of those, I'm going to. And so when I was in the market, I got one of these and I'm really happy with the way it sounds um, on trombone. Ribbon microphones tend to be a little darker, a little creamier sounding. They don't have as much high end, just the way that they work, they don't pick up as much high end information. So some of those airier things that we might not want in our sound, um, are not necessarily there. And that can be good, especially when we are recording up close. The downside of them is that they can sometimes be a little dull. So you might have to work with them a little bit after the fact in mixing. So that's a very basic primer about like these different microphone types. There's a lot of different variation. They're gonna have slightly different sounds, different price points, all that type of stuff. Let's just hear an example of these three different microphones. So I recorded this in sort of an array where all my microphones are set up in front of me at the same time. And I just recorded one take of this etude and that way I can swap between them so you can hear the different sound qualities. They're subtle. And I would really encourage you to listen on headphones or some good quality speakers so you can hear the differences. I will move through them as I move through this etude. It's based on the chord changes for the tune Recordame. So we're gonna hear the first 16 bars when we're talking about some of this room setup, and then we're talking about mixing. We'll check out the second 16 bars. So here's the etude. I will cycle through the different microphones so you can hear the different sounds, and I will display it on the screen so you can see which one is which. I will add before we hear this, these are all the unprocessed signals. So there's no EQ, no compression, no anything. This is just like the raw audio signal that you get from these microphones. I've level matched them so that they're all the same level. So that way you won't be sort of like tricked to thinking that one of these is louder. So then we might prefer that. A lot of times when we hear something louder, we think it sounds better. Just that's kind of our natural bias as listeners. And so they've been level matched. But other than that, there is no other effects or plugins on them. So the differences are there, but they're pretty subtle. And if you had any of these microphones, you could do a lot of good work with them. Now, the setup that I use, like I said, I use that Sennheiser 421 as my live microphone. That's really my go-to. And then I'm using this Royer ribbon microphone as my recording microphone. Now, I mentioned I don't really love condenser microphones, at least for the way I sound all the time. They're just a little harsh on my sound. I think I already tend to struggle with a little bit of an airy sound, and it really emphasizes that. But if I am in an actual recording studio, not recording at home, my preferred setup is to use a ribbon and a condenser microphone at the same time. The two work really great together. The ribbon is sort of dark and creamy. The condenser can be sort of bright and airy. You mix them together and they can really capture the trombone, I think in most brass instruments for that matter, sound really, really accurately. And if you see somebody recording and they have two microphones in front of them, they're a brass player, almost guaranteed it's a ribbon at a condenser. That's just a classic thing. So let's hear just an example of that, of both of these together, and especially compared to just the ribbon microphone. Again, I'll level match them so that the dynamic level will be the same. <laughs> Now, 
all honesty, I've never actually used this pairing of microphones before. And as I'm recording this, I haven't mixed and listened back to it. So I actually don't know what that's going to sound like. I'm assuming it's probably going to sound like what I want because that's usually my sort of favorite sound. But, you know, you be the judge. Do you like just the ribbon? Do you like both of them together? Maybe you like one of the other microphones together. Just keep that in mind as maybe you're making a purchase or if you're going into the studio um, so you can tell a potential recording engineer. All right, the second half of our sort of recording and tracking setup information is to talk about our room. So most of us do not have a very good sounding room when we're recording at home. You know, our houses are not built for recording. Little box rooms that have relatively low ceilings are not ideal. Now me, here at my home studio, I built this space a couple years ago in an unfinished basement, specifically to practice in, to teach in, to record in. And as you can see, I have a bunch of these panels all around the room. They are soundproofing panels. They absorb some of the sound to get rid of some of the reverb. And then I also have some bass traps in the corner that hopefully help suck up what are called standing waves or nodes in the room and just make the room a more desirable room to record. Now, I'm not a, an acoustic engineer or something like that. I just did some research online. I built these. You can buy them, but they're relatively easy to build if you have some good DIY knowledge. Even if you just have basic knowledge, it's, it's very easy to do. It's, it's all just simple material you could buy at any home improvement store. And I actually covered mine in maybe a little nicer looking canvas. That's where most of the expense was for me on these, but they really improved my room. They did a huge amount to make this sound a little more professional in the recording process. I should, I also do have these on my ceiling and that made a really big difference before I put uh, them on my ceiling. The room was still sounding pretty reverby and not super great. So that really helped a lot as well. The big question for a lot of people is what you see right behind me. This diffuser made of all of these little short sticks of wood in a specific pattern that's supposed to like scatter the sound and make the reverberation in the room more desirable. In all honesty, I don't think that's doing that much in my room. I built it more because I already had the lumber and I knew it was gonna look really cool behind me as like a background for my YouTube videos. It is hopefully doing something, but I've never sort of A, B tested it to see if it really is. And a lot of times in small rooms like this, absorbing sound is more important than diffusing it. So just keep that in mind. Do you need to treat your own room? Not necessarily. If you want to do a lot of recording at home, it would make your recording sound much more professional. And especially if you want to use better microphones, if you don't have a treated room, a really high quality microphone is not really going to do that much for you because your room is just going to kind of overwhelm and kind of uh, dilute any goodness that would be there from the better microphone. So if you want to use better microphones, you do need to really have a treated room. But what if you don't want to treat your room? The solution there is to buy a good quality dynamic microphone. In an untreated room, a great quality dynamic microphone is probably going to give you better results recording because you're going to get right up close to it. And you're also going to get that rejection that we talked about from a dynamic microphone. So it's going to sort of like keep all that horrible room noise or echoey room noise, reverby room noise out of your signal. So if you have an untreated room and you don't plan to treat it, I would get a good quality dynamic microphone and run with that and you'll probably like the results. Even if you prefer to use a condenser or a ribbon microphone, in most of our spaces in a home recording setting, I would still recommend close miking. If you're in a great sounding room, you can take a little bit of a step back. You'll probably like the results a little bit more. But for most of us who don't have ideal sounding rooms, even me, where my room is treated at least to a relatively good level, I still like the sound I get more when I'm a little bit closer. And so what do I really mean by a close mic? It's probably gonna be somewhere between six inches to maybe a foot away from the bell. Let's just hear a tiny example of that etude and I'll go to another camera view so you can really see where these microphones are in relationship to my bell. Cool, you can see that they're like pretty much right there. Now that is gonna probably give me a little bit more air in the tone, which I may change with EQ later, but it's probably gonna overall give me a better sound. You might've noticed one of those microphones was quite tilted. That's the ribbon microphone that I use all the time. And I found that I get a little better result if rather than recording straight onto the microphone, I had that tilted a little bit out of a 45 and above my bell. That helps to minimize a little bit of the air. And I found gives me more of the sound I'm looking for. That's a pretty fine detail, but something because I use that microphone all the time, I've experimented with and kind of figured out what works best for me. Cool, that's the end of part one here. So that gets us all of our information into our DAW. We've tracked it, hopefully sounding great. That's actually really, really important. If you make some errors when you're tracking, i.e. your microphone side of his bag, or your room sounds like a piece of trash, it doesn't matter how good of a mixer you are, you're really gonna be salvaging bad material. Tracking and making things sound the best they possibly can when you record 
is half the battle really when you're trying to create good content so make sure that you have some of that stuff working think about microphone selection think about microphone placement think about where you are in your room and that will get you a long way towards sounding good so we'll see you in a couple weeks to talk about the second half of this all the mixing stuff